Man, how exciting is this? I'm extremely honored and excited to get this podcast up and off the ground. Extremely honored and excited for those of you that have tuned in. I've talked about this podcast or finding an avenue to be able to share ideas with people and being able to just expand my reach and network for years. Yeah, this is such a blessing. So I appreciate your ears, you tuning in, especially for episode one. This being my first episode, I expect the introduction to be a little bit longer simply because I want to lay some groundwork, the foundation, housekeeping items here, just about the podcast, the platform, who I am, what the goal is of the podcast and where I'm headed with it, what you guys can expect from me. Obviously, if the background or my dating profile here doesn't interest you and you guys want to just jump to the meat of this, Feel free to skip ahead a few minutes. I've got a guest on this episode. Extremely excited to chat with him. So feel free to skip ahead a few minutes and jump right to the meat of this. A bit about me, just to kind of, I think as I run through my story, I can kind of segue into setting up the podcast. Obviously, my name is Josh Rhodes. I'm 25. I turned 26 the day this podcast released, so February 28th. I'm a first-generation graduate from the Rhodes family or from my family. First-generation graduate from college. I actually went to school and played football at Benedictine College in Kansas. My father was the one that raised me majority of my life. He, my stepmother, I've got three brothers. And my dad is one of the hardest workers that I've ever met to date. One of the hardest working people I've ever met. And while he was able to instill the work ethic in me with no formal education, no set career path, he's actually worked at a power plant my entire life. He wasn't able to give me much direction or tips or strategies or techniques or approaches in how to build wealth and how to make your money go work for you. Upon my college graduation, I start a career in sales. I currently work. I sit in Houston, Texas, uh, but I do a ton of traveling for my job as a sales guy. I'm touching a lot of the states on the West Coast. Uh, I spend time in California, Oregon, Washington, a lot of the mountain states, Western Canada. I'll be there in a few weeks. So I spend a lot of my time in the Western region and I sell a cybersecurity solution. We protect businesses that store their data in public clouds. That is the most I'll geek out about you guys or for you guys about my nine to five. In a sales role, for those of you that have worked there or you're familiar with a bit of work ethic, obviously opportunity, uh, (laughs) a little bit of luck. You have the opportunity to really build your own sort of wealth, really, and really start to build a bit of cushion. I had that opportunity, right? The company that I worked at, I've worked at since I got out of college, so no jumping around. I've been promoted a handful of times and just through the grind, have found myself building a little bit of disposable income. And again, with no real form or formal training or support on how to go make those dollars work for me, I found myself that lack of training sort of sticking out like a sore thumb, right? And rather than putting my head in the sand and just sort of ignoring the problem and dumping money into a savings account, right? Not having that money grow for me, which to be totally transparent, it's what I've done for a really long time. It's just, I don't know what to do with this, so put it in a savings account, right? So I've decided, or I guess rather than doing the other option of blitzing an avenue, whether that be you know the multifamily real estate market or dumping all my, all my money into a stock market or Rather than just betting big on myself and owning my own business, right, and going for it, rather than putting all my money towards a single avenue, I've decided to maybe take a step back, right, and really survey the market. And what I've found, there are thousands of ways to build wealth out there. Each of those avenues, there are dozens of opinions and efforts and successes and failures and strategies. And so, With each of us looking to build or to potentially build a second and third and fourth stream of income, I've decided to reach out to experts within these different fields, right? These are uh, entrepreneurs, real estate investors, 
angel investors. These are certified financial planners. These are CEOs and founders. These are all across the board, right? Of folks that have built wealth in a variety of ways. I pull them on the podcast, understand their journey, and look to extract some of their successes and tips and things that have helped them along the way to really see, one, does it interest us? And two, if it does, how do we get started? Today, I've interviewed roughly 30-ish people. I'm recording this about a week before launch. So I've queued up several interviews just through my own sort of outreach and building this thing over the last couple months. And to be really, to be honest, I'm extremely excited. I wanted to launch all of them right out of the gate. I plan on rattling them off week over week. Now I'm going to say one a week. That is likely to change as we pivot here. And I think that kind of leads me to my next point, the customer or the listener feedback. This, I look at this platform, this Roads to Wealth platform as much as your journey. This is as much your journey as it is mine. And I'm looking to truly be a student, not only to the guest, but be a student to you all, right? And I'm sure you all have expertise or knowledge in different areas. If through this journey and through these podcasts and episodes and content that I'm releasing, if you guys have questions, if things come up, whatever the case is, I'm looking to open up and keep a sort of two-way street or two-way side of communication here, right? That handle that I'm asking you reach out to throughout this process is going to be info at roadstowealth.com. That's the email address. That goes directly to me. I get it on every device I've got. And so my goal here is to sort of open up that line of communication, us to start getting some back and forth. And maybe during an episode, you guys have a question that surfaces that I don't ask. Or there at the end of the episode, a vertical or an idea or one of these guests really get your guys' attention and you want us to double down and really dig into a topic. Let me know that as I'm really hoping that us together as a community can sort of guide this thing and see what this platform turns into. What this platform goes into, I'll use it as maybe a final segue here of where all you guys can find me. My primary sort of driver pusher is going to be the roadstowealth.com. Though I've got every social media platform you can think of, including LinkedIn. I've got Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all that good stuff. I try to share my content throughout all the platforms. I'll look to get a bit more active as far as getting on live and sharing the stories and things like that. Definitely feel free to connect with me there. Though that info at Roads to Wealth is going to be the best way to get a direct line of communication. Finally, there's a really sick, fantastic intro and outro here to the podcast. A friend of mine, a really, really close friend of mine, Quentin Shackelford actually made that for us, really busted his ass on getting this thing done, and I think it sounds great. So I want to give him a quick shout out. I'll make sure that he's tagged here in the show notes. Feel free to drop by, ask any questions you guys have to him. I believe he's actually making, selling his music. So Feel free to connect with him if you guys have any questions. Without further ado, what you guys have really come for, and I'm excited to introduce my number one guest, Patrick Yankee. Patrick started his career by getting his education in the United States Air Force. He actually got his Bachelor of Science in Aeronautical Aerospace Engineering Technology. He went on to actually serve the United States Air Force almost seven years before going to college for financial planning and becoming a certified financial planner in 2004. He then built his expertise and understanding at A.G. Edwards & Sons, where he landed an organization or landed a job there just shortly after graduating due to some of his relationships you'll hear about on the podcast. As he spread his wings there within A.G. Edwards & Sons, he actually went on to open his own company at Yankee Financial and Yankee Academy. He's branched into speaking, book writing. He's an author, as well as his primary stream there of the certified financial planning. 
it's a great opportunity to really pick his brain and understand some of the pros and cons of CFPs, the different types, styles, strategies, things they look at, benefits of having one. I was really able to kind of take a first pass here as it's our first CFP to explore and understand some of the foundational aspects of this. I think I've spoken enough, at least here in the intro. I'm excited to have you guys here. I appreciate your time. Let's get this episode going. The road of the wealth, yeah. I do it for health. Yeah. My kids and my spouse, yeah. financially sound. You're the bad dad. Patrick, I said this offline, but I really appreciate the opportunity here. You're actually the first certified financial planner, not to steal your thunder, but the first certified financial planner that I've had on the podcast. So I've got a lot of questions for you. <laughs> and uh, I've been really excited about the conversation. Well, I appreciate the invitation and proud to be the first. Yeah. I guess before we get started, I'll give a quick shout out to Marcus Ogden, who's been on the podcast before. He made this introduction, the connection, relationship, all that good stuff. So I definitely wanted to give him a quick shout out and thank you. Before I get the ball totally rolling here, Patrick, I like to start this off by kind of doing a broad stroke of just if you could tell me a bit about who you are and what you have going on. In terms of who I am, uh, I guess professionally, my career started in the Air Force, uh, graduated in the United States Air Force Academy. And the way these two things go together, where I went from the Air Force to financial planning, is my father was, had a career with A.G. Edwards. When I was a junior at the Academy, his boss called me out of the blue one day and uh, said, if you ever leave the military, I want to hire you too. So all the way through my Air Force uh, time, I knew what I was going to follow on to. I did financial presentations for my troops, pointing out to them this sometimes can be a little bit of a rivalry between uh, the enlisted and the officers. The enlisted look at how much the officers make and that sort of thing. I would point out to them, most of those officers are deep in debt with college loans, and that's what it took to get a college degree, and you have to have a college degree to be an officer. As an enlisted person, you came out of high school, and you didn't incur all those debts. You came into a paying job in the military, and if you invest your money well, you're going to come out ahead if you'd actually do that. Hmm. I did have a couple people take me up on that, kept in touch through the years, and they're doing extremely well, but most of them still kind of outfitted their dorm rooms with every electronic device they can imagine and bought the Mustangs. So you try. The truth is that time in the market works. So Hmm. the earlier you start saving, the better off you're going to be. And I, I did get that point across to a few. So my journey took me from the Air Force. I knew it was time to get out. I went back to my dad, who's at the time, he was a branch manager himself. I said, okay, it's about time to leave the Air Force. What should I do in, pre- in preparation? I would uh, started my master's degree a couple of times, had to leave it a couple of times for deployments overseas. What should I do now? And I actually started uh, working on my certified financial planning certificate before I left the Air Force. Got the first module done, started the module on investment planning, and then here comes A.G. Edwards, and they teach me through their own program, a, a world-renowned program for education through investments and that sort of thing. And so I, I joined A.G. Edwards. A couple of years later, I realized that I'm never going to have more time than I have now. So I finished my CFP. And that was my journey into financial planning. It actually started uh, while I was in college uh, when I had no intention at the time of being a financial planner. My degree is actually aeronautical engineering with a minor in the Arabic language. (laughs) (laughs) That's going to be my first question to you as we walk through your journey. I ended up taking a career path that has nothing to do with my education either. A kinesiology major, I now sell cybersecurity for the cloud. The two don't go together at all. I would say yours, not that they are as far apart, but equally as just you made a total pivot, but that was done with intention, right? I mean, you mentioned going into this, you knew you had this sort of financial planner career ahead of you. Did you find that pivot more difficult because you weren't taking the financial planning classes or you didn't have the accounting or finance background? You had more of the engineering mindset. I mean, was that a tough transition for you or was that done again with intention? Well, actually, it's a fairly easy transition for me because my job in the Air Force, you know, when I graduated from the Air Academy, it was 1993. That was the drawdown from the Gulf War. I went in to be a pilot. I was an aeronautical engineering major because that would help me go to test pilot school and those sorts of things. I never actually wanted to sit down and design airplanes. I wanted to fly them. Because I didn't get pilot training, I had to find another job in the Air Force. And the job that I got uh, was actually in food service initially. And at the time, I was a bit disgruntled as as a a guy who wanted to sit in the cockpit and didn't get a cockpit. So my boss was very understanding. She encouraged me to apply for another job on base in recruiting. So I became the uh, chief of advertising and promotion across the Southeast region for recruiting. And the tie into what I'm doing now is in recruiting, you're actually selling an intangible. You're talking about national security. You're talking about education and training for your kids. You're talking about their future and, and maybe retirement someday on a military pay. 
whatever the case might be, it's about a future intangible. And that uh, actually dovetails very well into what I'm doing. Hmm. But then the time came where I needed to go back to my uh, primary career field, and I became a combat support flight commander. And the combat support flight commander is in charge of not just food service, but also lodging, libraries, mortuary affairs, a whole grab bag of things, uh, the base honor guard, all of that. The mortuary affairs uh, dovetails extremely well into things like estate planning. Hmm. So you've got the uh, recruiting that uh, was a good dovetail for you know, future or retirement in terms of an intangible there. You got the estate planning dovetails great into uh, estate planning. And I found that all the way along, God has kind of led my steps and trained me for what the next job is going to be. And it actually wasn't that big a pivot to make that change. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, especially when you lay it out like that. Speaking of dovetailing into something that almost perfect alignment with your dad having somewhat of a financial background, I believe you mentioned he's more transactional, but with him having more of a a financial background, did you find going into the Air Force Academy or coming out of the Air Force Academy, had he already laid the groundwork for maybe some very basic sort of foundational investing tips or strategies or things that you should be doing with your money? I mean, you mentioned you were already having conversations there on the base of telling folks around you, here's what you should be doing. Is that coming from your father? And was he able to lay some of the groundwork there? Or where are you pulling that from? So when I was 10 years old, you know, all the way through our life, my dad had been big on encouraging savings. We had uh, small savings accounts that grew over time. When I was 10 years old, my dad joined AG Edwards. One of the first things he did was take a portion of those savings accounts, walk me into his office and make my first investment. Mm -hmm. So if you want to talk about a groundwork that was laid, the biggest work was understanding the value of time and patience in the markets. You know, he got me started early. Obviously, I wasn't going to touch that for many years to come. And honestly, today, I still haven't. So even at the Air Force Academy, one of the neat things about being a cadet at the academy, at least at the time, was... The, the local car dealers recognize you're a really good investment. You're going to come out of college with a guaranteed job. You're going to be paid by the military. You're a really good investment for loans. So they provided very low interest rate car loans. Mm. Being investment minded, I didn't use mine to buy a car. I already had a car, but I did take out the loan. I invested it back into my investments and I still have those investments today and they've grown considerably. So I've always had an investment mindset and yeah, it does come from my father. Uh, not just when he joined AG Edwards. He joined AG Edwards because the local manager recognized his investment-minded talents. He did well on the tests. We just, uh, he knew he'd be a natural at it. And when it came time that I was going to join the firm, of course, I took the tests as well and found that I had an aptitude as well. So it wasn't just going into this and saying, my dad did, I'm going to do it. But it was having that aptitude that my father clearly showed going into the firm. And then when I tested and went into the firm showing I had the same aptitude and what I learned uh, at his knee, I guess you could say, or growing up in his household is a good match for, for what I'm doing. Mm. The auto loan, I think you mentioned that offline. I had jotted down just a little note. And the auto loan piece is so fascinating to me. I mean, what genius, it makes a ton of sense. I'm assuming the, the interest rate on something they'd offer you there, it's what, probably 3%, 2%, something extremely low. At the time, it was probably, I think it was 1.9%. Jeez. We're talking 1991, so figure what the market's done since. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll, uh, we'll take that. <laughs> exactly. You start to get this CFP before you even leave the Air Force. You at least had taken the first module, knowing where you were going. I want to spend 10-ish minutes. I want to spend some time here talking through the actual CFP process and what does it mean to be a certified financial planner. You mentioned you had taken a module, so it sounds like there's classes, schooling. I guess that's going to be my first question. Just what does it take to become a CFP? Is that school? Is that certifications? Is it practitioner hours? Just kind of help me understand what does it take to become a CFP? Sure. So the basic courses for it, there's five modules. First module is risk management. Then you get into equities and uh, investments, get into uh, things like tax planning and retirement planning and estate planning. So you go through these five modules and typically the the coursework is a year to two years. And then you sit for a test. It's a two-day test, part of it one day, part of it another day. That's just to have the basic qualification and training to be a CFP, but then you also have to have the experience. So even if you got the education under your belt, then you also have that experience in the industry, 1,000 hours doing what you're doing, and it's all laid out as far as the the CFP board. But once you have the experience combined with with the education, that's how you get the CFP. Mm. You mentioned CF board or the CFP board. I visited their website last night just in, in preparation for this and found there are currently... 86,378 CFPs in the United States. 
Okay, you're feeling, making me feel a little less special now. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> it sounds big when you say it, but in the grand scheme of things, that's not much. I mean, as far as who actually has their ear to the ground. Furthermore, let me ask you this first. Knowing that there's 86,000 CFPs out there, can someone that's not a CFP go on the market to manage money? Yes. So you'll find that in the industry, you probably have, and this is just my own personal observation, that maybe a third of people at a branch or less might have a CFP designation. So that means that a good two thirds, the three quarters of a branch of financial managers don't have a CFP designation. And that could be, you know, that they've been managing for so long, they don't see a need for it. They've been doing it for 30, 40 years and it's worked well. So why change what works? And there's no need to tack on uh, extras there. But it could also just be that what's working for them is working. Kind of like you know, coming out of my father's household and understanding the basics of financial management, doing it myself and applying it to others, they may not see uh, the need. But in a world that's getting more and more complex, I do think that understanding a little deeper about the industry and, and all that it offers helps clients. You might have a very simple plan for your client, but that plan is only simple because you know what the other options are. Sure. When someone's paying you, they're not paying you for the 15 minutes of work that you just did on the computer to come up with uh, the simple spreadsheet or whatever. They're paying you for the years of experience that went into to understand how that spreadsheet works. So that's really what the CFP does. It gives you a broader perspective on the industry so that what you've done for the last 20, 30 years might give you a good basis for wealth management. But the CFP might broaden your horizons to say this is what else is available in the industry. It might change your perspective a little bit on what's right for the client. For someone that doesn't have the CFP certification, they haven't been labeled that, what title do they carry? Are they, are they still a financial planner? Are they a financial advisor? Like, what do we call them? It seems if I could just, I'm going to exercise my transparency here. It doesn't quite make sense for me. If I'm going to give my wealth or my earnings over to someone else to manage, I want that someone else to be obviously well-educated, but I want them, I mentioned earlier, have their ear to the ground and fine-tuned and know what's going on. The fact that you don't have to have that sort of certification or that experience or that expertise kind of sketches me out a little bit. Folks have different experience in different areas. You're going to find that a lot of people in this industry come from other industries. So maybe they are uh, they came out of the tech industry or the manufacturing industry. They understand that industry really well, so they mm. might actually focus a lot of their attention in those areas. And that's when I talk about you know, broadening horizons. It's not that they're unqualified. They just may not have a full breadth of uh, what's available. So what you're going to find in terms of job titles, you'll find financial consultant, financial advisor. You'll even find financial planners. But if they're going to use certified financial planner, the trademark name there, they really should have the designation. But you also find sales titles, you know, vice president of investments, senior vice president of investments. Those mm-hmm. tend to be sales titles that go with production. And higher levels of production do show a certain level of competence because people are going to work with someone who does a good job for them. They're going to refer to other people that do a good job for them. So I don't in any way designate or denigrate those other titles that people have because those titles do mean some success in the industry. Definitely. Yeah, that's fair. And to call out, there's a chance they didn't go to school for it, but they may have some sort of expertise in the industry and then back out. And now that they've had 20 years in the tech world, come out and be specific to the tech industry. That's fair. I'm going to ask the same question about CFPs, if you don't mind. You mentioned you've got the five, six-ish modules, the five modules that you've got to take through to be named the CFP. Once you've been labeled or once you've been granted that and you've been certified, do financial planners tend to specialize, right? I'm thinking it'd be great if financial planners certified in creating fire, right? In the millennial world, or the, the millennial era, I hear a lot of folks talk about the financially independent retire early, right? So would a financial planner really develop expertise or become specialized in millennial fire and then someone else becomes specialized in estate planning and another one becomes specialized in maybe wealth preservation or something of that nature, right? So I guess my question is, do we find that CFP specialize in maybe a subject or maybe even a person, right? I just want to onboard or work with millennials, or I just want to onboard and work with solopreneurs or families. Well, in the industry broadly, yeah, you find that there is a certain amount of niche marketing where people are trying to carve out, I work with women entrepreneurs. I work with people that are serial entrepreneurs. You know, 
people do try to uh, specialize a bit. When you're a CFP, the part of the definition of being a certified financial planner is having a very broad education. Mm. So you can specialize and you'll find CFPs that do. But if somebody walks in your office that has a different need than your specialty, the very fact that you have a CFP means that you should be able to handle that. So you will find that there is some niche marketing even among CFPs. Even you know, me personally, I tend to focus a lot on retirement estate planning. One thing that, uh, that I found in my career is really hard to do retirement planning without estate planning. And some people don't look at it that way. They want to be a retirement specialist. They want to be an estate planning specialist. But the reality is retirement is an end of life stage. So part of retirement planning is recognizing that for a married couple, especially things are going to change somewhere along retirement. One of the other of you is leaving and can the other one continue on in the manner that become accustomed. So you have to plan for that ahead of time because you don't know when that's going to happen. So there's a certain amount of estate planning that has to occur, not to mention the fact that, okay, we're we going to draw down the assets through retirement. We're going to try to grow the assets. What's the purpose of the assets that we have? Are they for us? Or are they passing on to the heirs? So there's a whole lot of overlap between retirement and estate planning. And one of the reasons that I tend to specialize there is two things. One, we all want to get there. We all want to get to that point in life where we're no longer so much working for the money, but the money's working for us. It's a nice feeling. But two, we're all going to die someday. And that's just a simple reality of life. Whether you die early or late, you know, if you die early, you probably need life insurance or something out there to build an estate you didn't have time to build. Or if you die later, you might have an estate that you need to efficiently pass on to the next generation. But retirement and estate planning are really hand in glove together. Mm. Do you mind maybe elaborating a bit? And I say this because I had to Google it. <laughs> what exactly is estate planning? Estate planning in general is... It's more dealing with passing on assets to the next generation, but yeah. there is an aspect of it that deals with when you can no longer handle the assets yourself. So, for example, if you set up a trust and you're going to designate a successor trustee, you're going to say under what condition is that successor trustee taking over? Death is obvious. I'm no longer here. But there might also be a dementia or any number of reasons. I can't manage my own assets. That's where that trustee is going to step in while I'm still alive. Got it. So estate planning really encompasses both of those things. Essentially, the way I would describe it in a broader sense is that time in life when I can no longer manage my assets, now what happens? I might still be here and someone's managing them for me, or I might be passed on and now I've got executors with my will or trustees with my trust, but someone's managing my assets for me. Gotcha. So the broader sense of estate planning is just recognizing there comes a time when I'm not going to be able to do it anymore. That helps a ton. Yeah, thank you. If I could go back to the CFP... I guess, engagement piece. I've found there are a couple different engagement strategies with a, a certified financial planner. The two I've researched or found the fee-based, commission-based, and this may be somewhat of a good segue into Yankee Financial, uh, just because you've had experience with both types there. But can you maybe walk me through the difference between the two engagements? Sure. Generally, what used to set apart the commission-based advisor and the fee-based advisor was fiduciary duty. And the fiduciary duty essentially is putting the client's needs above your own. And most people don't realize that when you're dealing with a commission broker, essentially they're, they're brokering investments. You know, you've, I've got a buyer here, I've got a seller there, I'm bringing those together. And they should act in the best interest of their client, absolutely. But that standard was never really formalized. It's just simply, it's like if you ever saw the movie Boiler Room or whatever else, they've got these yeah. investments to sell. They're calling people and saying, you want to buy these investments. There isn't a whole lot of duty there to the client. It's about selling investments. The fee-based world has always been generally recognized as having that fiduciary standard, is that you're putting the client's interest first. You're getting on board with the client. You want your fees to grow, then grow the client's assets. You want to protect mm -hmm. your, your fees on the downside, protect the client's assets. It helps you work together with your client. Having said that, recognize that anyone with a CFP designation is a fiduciary by the uh, board uh, standards. So that if, whether you're doing commission-based or you're doing uh, fee-based, right there, if you work with the CFP, he already is a fiduciary. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, and so you mentioned a minute ago that my dad made a business on the commission side of things. Again, he was one that always recognized that this is a relationship-based business. So he had very deep relationships. I mean, talking about people from way back when... And I don't want to, you know, people who can Google me, I might end up finding some of these people. Let's just say like some of my elementary school teachers and pediatricians and people that, uh, that go way back in relationships. You don't build that uh, depth of relationship without putting people's needs first. So he always did that, even though he thought that the best way to deal with a client was from a commission side of things. So when I came into the industry, I followed in his footsteps. He made a good business out of commission-based. I can make a good business out of commission-based. Sure. And I've done a good job. You know, I've been in the industry now for 20 years. 
But I will tell you that in the last couple of years, I've, I've made a change. And the reason I made a change is because I sat across from a friend of mine who had over a million dollars to invest. Investing that million dollars, it would have been very efficient to go with a certain type of investment that wouldn't cost him a whole lot up front. And he would, in fact, it wouldn't cost him anything up front. And the underlying fees would have been very low. He ended up going with a fee-based advisor. And so he's going to keep paying those fees going on. It would have cost, in my mind, it would have cost him a lot more. And I didn't understand, you know, how did I lose this one considering I wasn't going to charge him anything directly? I did some research last summer, summer before last now, I guess. I get used to saying last summer. Summer before last, I did put a spreadsheet together. And I said, okay, let's look at the average expense ratio on your, your average investment plan out there. It's about 1.48%. Your average fee-based account plus all expenses in the range of 1.98%. When you run a spreadsheet down and say, what, how does it look for the client at the paying commissions and having the expense ratio versus having the fee-based account, after 10 years, you find out they're about even. Mm. Really opened my eyes and said, okay, so here I am trying very hard to protect my clients by not going fee-based, but that's not really the case. That's not what I found here. So then you break that down and look at it from the broker's perspective and say, okay, what does the broker get paid? And on the commission world versus the fee world, I'm making a quarter of what I should be making. So let me get this straight. I am not hurting the client by going fee-based and the world is going fiduciary anyway. And I get paid more for what I'm doing for my clients. I mean, it turned into a win-win, did a lot yeah. more research. And I found that fee-based world is the direction the world is going. I'm not hurting my clients by doing so. And it's been a good fit ever since. I've, I, I found a better world there. And I think you touched on this a, a bit, but can you help me understand when in each of these engagements, the fee-based, commission-based when I'm compensating or when we're paying the CFP, is that a month over month engagement to where maybe they're taking it out of the funds they're managing? Am I writing him a check month over month on both those avenues there? I mean, just help me understand cash in, cash out. How am I paying these guys? Sure. The traditional way for a fee-based model is that it's based on the assets under management. Mm -hmm. And like I said, the average at the time, at least fee-based account with all expenses in was about 1.98%. Got it. So the way it occurs is you say, okay, we set that fee level and say it's going to cost you 1.98% per year. Generally, you're going to get billed quarterly from the assets because it's based on the assets. My fee level, I've actually, I go in there with the, with the client in mind. So my fee level, I've, I've uh, limited to just 1%. I'm making plenty of 1%. I don't need to go beyond that. But at the same time, when you look at how that compensation actually comes out, there are changes happening in the industry. So the traditional model, again, is based on the assets, but there are, are now fee advisors who are just saying, this is what it costs to work with me. It costs you $10,000 a year to work with me. And however they pay them over that year, they work out, you know, it could be monthly, it could be quarterly, however they want to work it out. But there are some advisors out there that are actually completely separating the conversation from the assets under management to just the job that is being done. That's interesting. But again, I tend to be somewhat of a traditionalist and I'll see how that plays out before I make any changes in my own business. But the, the traditional model is working in my business and works for my clients. But there are other models out there. So that's where when someone sits down with a financial advisor, DFP or otherwise, find out how they're compensated and make sure it works for, uh, for your view. Yeah. And the other model there, I think you're kind of touching on a question I was going to piggyback onto. And it's that in both the fee-based and commission-based role, it seems that the CFP, which it makes a lot of sense, is going to be involved throughout the, I mean, in a perfect world from as soon as the relationship starts until the estate planning kicks in. Is there an opportunity or do are there CFPs, maybe you, or have you heard of CFPs that maybe do some sort of like hourly engagement to where maybe it someone's not looking for an ongoing, for you to manage things ongoing, but maybe they need six hours to sit down and talk about, here's my plan, what I'd like to do, where I'm going, how do I get there? And maybe you guys spend a few hours building something that he can manage and then you leave. Is that something that you've offered or that the CFP world would be that someone would offer? Or is that a totally different vertical market that I'm looking at? That model exists. Okay. I haven't personally encountered it, but that model does exist. So you pay a CFP to do a specific task for you. The reason I don't do that, and I try to I shy away from that personally, is because I don't want anyone to ever think, what's the cost of calling me for advice? Mm -hmm. now, someone's going to pick up the phone and say, like a lawyer, essentially, you know, okay, if I call my lawyer, he, car he charges me a quarter, uh, $250 an hour. So cha-ching, if I call my lawyer, it's going to cost money. I'm going to find my answer somewhere else. I'd rather people had the freedom, whether a current client or a prospect or otherwise, ask their questions, get the answers that they need and make wise choices. 
So that's always been my, kind of my watchword is that I want people to make wise choices. If I put up barriers to that, to me, that's not, that's not fulfilling my personal mission. Got it. I've got one more, I guess, question in this vein. One of my close family members leveraged a financial planner. And I don't know if it was a, a CFP or if they found someone that was just, I should have asked that. I talked to them this morning just in preparation for this, but they were leveraging a financial planner to manage all their wealth. And in 2008, they got sucker punched. I've kind of run through the story they told me, but this financial planner was managing over a million dollars of their funds. And they were getting a monthly statement or from that company. Month one, they look at that statement and they lost $100,000. And so they get a little shaky, they reach out and the, the response there of the financial planner is this is at this point, it's just paper, right? We're just looking at paper, just numbers on paper. Month two, they get another statement and they lost more than $100,000. They're de- rapidly losing money. They call back, same answer. Listen, this is just paper at this point, relax. Month three, uh, it started at over a million. Month three, they're at $300,000. So it just crashed that quickly. At that point, they obviously freak out. They lose trust. They ask to change their money somewhere else. And then you're SOL. You can't regain that money when you pull your money out of the market. And so my question is a very long-winded way. When I think about diversification, do people, folks that are looking to build wealth and maybe the wealthier use more than one CFP? My thought is, you know, if I put all my chips in one basket and let's just use you and I as an example, not to say you'd make a bad decision, but if you did, and I were to lose all of my wealth, it seems to make more sense if I had four or five CFPs that were both all dealing with $50,000 versus putting all 250 with one guy. I think the fees, obviously, it's something to look at. Getting 5% fees would be really tough. But from diversification, I mean, is that something you've ever seen or thought about or looked at or has someone done that? I guess I'm kind of just thinking of other questions we could do, other scenarios. I guess you want to go back to and say, why are you hiring a certified financial planner? Mm -hmm. If you're hiring them for their advice and for guiding you through your goals in life to reach an end uh, at the end of the game, if you have multiple advisors, you're also going to have multiple plans. And you're going to have people in there that are each trying to make their own statement on how things should go. And you're going to end up with a jumble, honestly. So one thing to recognize is you want to have diversification among your assets. You don't want to have all your eggs in one basket, no question. But in terms of the advisor on that asset, if you have diversification of opinion on how your assets should be managed, you're never going to have a a concrete plan. Yeah. So I understand, you know, when you look back at 2008, one thing to keep in mind, it never works well selling into a panic. Obviously, the scenario that you just gave, if they went down 70%, they're well down more than the broader markets. There probably should have been some adjustments in there to not be down more than the broader markets. I'm not going to gain, say, somebody else's management. I I can't see the portfolio. That's right. But you'd expect when the market's down that you probably should go along at least with the market, hopefully less than the market, maybe a little more. You don't want to be excessive, but you'd expect to be in that range. But the reality is, let's say you had an investor, you had somebody who was completely scared of the markets that absolutely would not invest. But from 2003 to 2007, he saw all his friends making so much money in the S&P 500. And he says, you know what? It's time. I'm getting in the market. I'm putting my money in. October 2007 puts all of his money in the S&P 500. And just as you said, what happens next is the fiscal crisis. You know what he has five years later? He has a 2.5% average annual return. You know what he would have had in cash? Virtually nothing. Mm. The reality is the long term takes out blips, even large blips like that. So you don't want to sell into a panic. You don't want to react emotionally to the market in the short term. Yes, things fell apart on the fundamentals. So there should have been some adjustments there. And hopefully people had uh, at least some minor adjustments in that environment to not go down completely with the market. But the most important thing is that your client is comfortable enough to stay with the investments to come back up on the other side. As you said, you know, selling at the bottom is, is the worst thing you can do. The same with an advisor, hopefully will allow someone not to make that worst decision. And then mm-hmm. you're just going to have different levels of management through it. I'm going to fast forward a question I wanted to ask you in a bit, but I think it's a, a really good segue. One of the big things that colleagues, friends, mentors, this, I'm going to go back to this millennial era that we think about and talk about is the last dip or crash we saw was 2008, right? And, and I'll speak for myself in that in 2008, I was still in, let's see, I'm still in high school at that point. And so building wealth or what that looks like, obviously not in my wheelhouse, but knowing that it sounds, at least in the US economy, that we're due, right? And that this is the longest streak we've had, this longest uptick, blah, blah, blah. My question to you is, 
more than once, I would say, at least in my circle, 70, 80% of the folks talk about, well, let's build this nest egg or this bucket of wealth and let's just sit on it. And when the market crashes and you know, whether it be real estate or stocks or both, then we've got this bucket of cash we can just dump into the market and let this thing recline and then we're all filthy rich, right? And so my question to you, somewhat know the answer, but I, I, this is a great opportunity for me to actually get some, some education behind it. Is timing the market a real thing? I mean, is it safe to say we're on the verge of hitting some sort of recession? I think just this morning, I was listening to your Q1 capital market review on your website, and we talked about recession risks are rising. Is it, is it possible that the recession is coming? It doesn't make sense. I mean, is it plausible or is it an okay idea for us to sit on cash and wait for that dip and then try to execute? Generally, you don't want to try to time the market. And unfortunately, that is what happens when you sit on cash. So there's a dollar bar study that uh, gets updated every year. How has the average investor done for the last 20 years? And the average investor has done about 1.9%. And this is while the S&P 500 has done 5.9% on average for 20 years. Meanwhile, inflation has done about 2.2%. So the average investor hasn't even beaten inflation for the last 20 years. Why even invest? And that's because they tend to get emotional. They jump in when things are good. They jump out when things are bad. Sitting on a, a pile of cash, when you look at all of the assets available to you over the last 20 years, when you look to the bottom of the chart, it's cash. Cash is not an investment plan. Cash is a holder of value. So if you truly think we're headed toward recession, okay, then make, make uh, decisions based on that. But I will tell you that economies don't head to recession just because it's time. Mm -hmm. Expansions don't end just because of old age. They do that because of imbalances in the economy. So even though this is the longest post-World War II expansion that our country has seen, you have to recognize that other countries have actually seen longer. In fact, Australia is still working on 30 years in their current expansion. So can it go on? Yeah, it can. And when you look at economic forecasts, economic forecasts really are only good about a year out. Because if you understand the economics, essentially what you do is, okay, let's put all variables uh, static and see what happens to this variable when we change it. Let's all other variables static and let's uh, change this variable and see what happens. Mm. That only works in the short term. Because when you get over a year out, there's too many variables to have really good clear view on things. So what I would say is those that have a negative view of the economy right now are not looking at the current economy. Yes, the recession risks are rising simply because you've got uh, inflation has a potential to move up because wages are rising. You've got that the yield curve did invert, but at the same time, we've had false positives before. But then you've got two thirds of the economy is driven by consumers and the consumers are as strong as they've ever been currently. Yeah. So in the current environment right now, we're not signaling recession. We're just recognizing we're in the late stages of an expansion. It's not going to end just because of time frame. It's going to end when things literally fall apart. So in that capital markets review, you know, there's a pretty good chart in there that shows the, uh, the four main areas of the economy and trying to get a gauge on how those four areas are doing and trying to gauge recession. And when we see those falling apart, then certainly we're saying, okay, we're, we're starting to head toward recession. We, if you look back to the fiscal crisis, we can see yeah, these numbers fell apart. We should have seen that recession coming. So ClearBridge is the one that came up with this chart and it's very well backward tested. It's something I plan to watch. If I get a red signal on there, then certainly I'm going to be thinking, okay, recession's on the way. But I'm not thinking that right now. I do think recession risks are rising over the last nine years. I don't think that we're headed right at recession at the moment. One thing to keep in mind also when you talk about the millennials and the fiscal crisis, we have a tendency to see the next recession and the next downturn in the market in the light of the last one. So we talk about the Great Depression generation. They were very fearful of the markets because they were experienced through the Great Depression. And again, the reality is anybody who invested after the Great Depression had made a killing since then. But they were so spooked by that they didn't do it. So I would caution millennials to not make the same mistake that some of the, the Great Depression generation made in the fear of the markets. Because at the end of the day, what are the markets? The markets are a representation of the economy itself, or at least the, the companies in the economy. And as long as earnings are rising in those companies, then valuations should be rising and it's worth participating in. Hmm. The whole reason we invest is to stay ahead of inflation. And if we don't stay ahead of inflation, why are we even investing? So if we're going to react emotionally, if we're going to have worse outcomes than even inflation itself, you shouldn't be in the market. But if you want to keep, have your money relevant when you get to retirement and say, okay, putting the money into my mattress and pulling it out in retirement is a lot like the effect of moths on clothing. They're going to eat away at the money. It's not going to be worth the same amount then because of inflation eating away at it. 
The whole reason we invest is to stay ahead of inflation, to make sure our money is relevant in the future. I've got more buying power. That's why we invest. You've got to focus on the goal and look at the long term and not view the future in light of the past because we have to sell all the time and the future results may not match past results. It's reality. Let's talk about, you've got your ear to the ground to, I mean, daily, which is something that the typical nine to five cybersecurity salesman, as far as financial ticks, do you mind maybe talking through how you invest, what your portfolio looks like as a CFP? I mean, what moves do you make? First, I'll tell you is I don't make a whole lot of moves. <laughs> I'm very much a buy and hold kind of guy. I make changes when it uh, makes sense to make changes. But your biggest advantage in the market is patience. The only reason that uh, you leave a bad investment is when you discover that it truly is a bad investment. If the investment itself is just simply out of favor, no, then it may come back into favor. There are, there are cycles in the market. So the most important thing for anyone to recognize when they are investing is it's going to take patience. It's a good one from, uh, from Warren Buffett. You know, Warren Buffett is once recorded as saying, don't invest in the market if you can't stand to lose half of your wealth tomorrow. That's the nature of the market. As soon as you invest, the money's going down. Mm. And okay, should I sell? Well, as soon as you sell, the market's going up and leaving you behind. That is the nature of the market. You can't react emotionally. If you think you're going to react emotionally, don't do it. I actually talked to a client the other day out of investing because based on our conversation, he wasn't a good fit. He was looking for that assurance that if he goes in the market, it's not going to go down. I said, I promise you, when you put your money in the market, it is going to go down. That's, right. That's the nature of the market. And if you can't take that, then don't do it. So like you said, it's not a one size fits all for every person, but there is one thing that is common to all investors and it is that patience. You've got to be patient with, with the assets to allow them to grow because it's the impatience that jumping in and jumping out when things get good and get bad, that leads to that 1.9% over the last 20 years for the average investor. I'm going to try to find another commonality. <laughs> Patience, I think, is a, I mean, obviously a keystroke, the removal of just emotions, which is so difficult, especially when you're talking about, I mentioned, I talked to my family member this morning and they mentioned when they got the call from the third month, I'm going to come down there and I'm going to hurt somebody. You're talking about wealth you've built over years and years. And to see that dip, it's such a gut punch. <laughs> Well, and again, that goes back to not one size fits all, but when, when an advisor is starting to get that kind of feedback, you know, you got to do something for your client. You know, sure. You're not meeting the client's sure. needs at that point if you're getting that kind of feedback. Yeah. I mentioned I'm going to try to find another commonality. I think here's how I'm going to do it is as you onboard your own clients, I think you've mentioned patience and acting on emotion a couple times. As you onboard your own clients, do you make any just initial changes, statements, let's call them laws or requirements out of the gate uh, for them to remove that animal instinct and to remove the emotion, right? Some things I'm thinking about, do you force them or ask them to automate their finances, right? And have some sort of automated cash flow. Money goes into the checking. And from that point, just automatically dump money into your retirement account. And then two days later, automatically have money transferred over to an investment account, right? Your Vanguard account. Automatically have money that pays off your credit card. Do you set up automation? Do you have them change their banks? Maybe go with some sort of online savings account? Do you have any things just right out of the gate? Here's changes you can make to immediately have an impact. Simple answer, no. I simply look at every client engagement as very much a job interview. I am looking to be hired by this person to do a job for them. and I don't come at them with, if you work with me, this is the way it's going to be. I'm looking at them and seeing if they're a good fit for my style of management. If they're looking for someone that's going to be out there playing penny stocks or whatever else, I'll tell them, you're probably better off with E-Trade and doing that sort of thing, honestly. That's sure. not who I am. So first thing is to find out if there's a fit. But when we go through that initial interview, I'm going to reach into things like, what are your debts? What are your assets? What's your income? What are your expenses? What's your budget? Do you have an emergency fund? Is your estate plan in order? When's the last time it was reviewed? We're going to go through all of those things. And what I'm looking for is ways that I can actually add value to this relationship. If I don't see any way to add value to the relationship, I'll tell them. I think you're in a good shape. I think whoever you're working with right now has done a good job for you. And if you want to work with me on a relationship basis, okay, I can appreciate that. But from a financial standpoint, not much is going to change because the last guy's done a good job for you. So I'm not in the position of generally making wholesale changes for the client. I make whatever changes make sense. And if I don't see where there's going to be a whole lot of changes, I'll tell them right up front. I'm not going to make a lot of changes. The last guy did a good job. But if I do see that there's big changes that need to be made, then okay, let's talk about those things. Are you willing to make those changes? 
And what you'll find is if you, the more changes you throw at someone and say, okay, to work with me, you're going to have to do uh, A through Z. The more of those things you throw at a client, the less likely they're to want to do it. Yeah. So then it becomes, again, that long-term relationship. You know, you say, okay, these are the immediate things you should do. Let's talk about bringing down the debts over here. Let's talk about getting your budget in order over here. And you start to develop that relationship and making those subtle changes along to get them in a good financial stead. Because you can't just end up a whole list and say, okay, now you're changing your bank accounts, you're changing this and that. That rarely works. Clients walk away, they don't actually implement the plan. If, you, yeah. if your goal is to get the client to do what you're recommending, then you need to present it in a way that they'll actually bite off on. Hmm. I do want to go back to that previous question you asked about my own investments. I realized I talked about other things. I didn't talk about my own investments. <laughs> One thing that I recognized early on in my career is, you know, you see those commercials where the investment company is counting the wires underneath the street and making their fiber optic uh, speculation for that company and how things are going to go. I'm not that guy. I am not there counting those wires. I'm not checking the inventory over at Apple. I'm not doing those things. So I rely on the money managers as well. I'll even tell my clients, if I recommend a stock to you, probably one you should sell short. That's just reality. Because I am not a financial analyst who's there with that company on every call and over there making sure that what they're saying is actually true. So in my own portfolio, I'm relying on professional management as well. And you'll find if you dug deeply into all my clients, that 90 to 95% of my clients have a very similar plan to my own with different levels of risk that they're willing to take versus me. But the people that I trust to manage my money, I trust to manage my clients' money. As far as you mentioned, most of your clients have a portfolio or at least a strategy that's similar to yours. Understanding each case is unique. Do you have a templatized, I'm thinking of like a, I will teach you to be re- rich, remit Sethi, like save 10%, put 2% and put 10% in your retirement account, 2% in your savings account. Do you have some sort of structured template out of the gate of, from that nature? Or is that again, just per client, each case is unique and it's kind of tough to, to provide numbers there? Well, very rarely do I find someone who has an adequate emergency fund built. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things I do for most of them is put them on a structured plan that they're going to build that emergency fund to get it to where it needs to be. Where does it need to be? Well, for an individual earner, uh, it needs to be in the range of six to 12 months of spending ability. You lose your job, you need some time to find a new job, et cetera. For dual earners, you've got husband and wife that are both earning, then it can be three to six months. So you take your expense, let's say it's $5,000 a month I'm spending. For a single earner, you're going to look at about an emergency fund in the range of $30,000. For dual learners, you might get by with 15, but you're still talking you know, bottom of uh, what's necessary. So the most important thing I do is, uh, is work on that emergency fund initially because most people don't recognize the emergency fund is the foundation of the financial plan. When an emergency arises, your kid fell out of a tree. Now you've got to go to the orthopedics. Uh, you've got braces for the kids. You've got your tires uh, on your car just gave out or somebody uh, totaled your car and they didn't have insurance and you don't have insurance. You just lost your job. Any one of these emergencies in life you're going to start reaching for where do you have assets. You're going to pull it out of your retirement assets. You're going to pull it out of the kids' assets. Whatever it takes because i got to meet this emergency. You have to have an emergency fund built or the, the lack of an emergency fund is going to blow apart those plans multiple times in life. I like to point people to the movie Up. You ever see Up? I have. Yeah, the first 15 minutes. You know, they're trying to save money to go to Paradise Falls, but then the tree falls on the house. And yep. so all these things happen. They keep breaking that jar. That's what the emergency fund is meant to prevent. Stop breaking the jars. Let your financial plan grow for the future. And so the emergency fund is foundational. So if there's something that I say to everybody, it's you must have that emergency fund to work with me. If you don't have it yet, we're going to build it. And then when it comes to retirement savings, obviously I'm getting paid for the assets that I manage. So if they're putting money into an IRA with me, I'm making money off of that. If they're putting money into the 401k, I'm not making money off of that. But I will tell anyone that if you've got a 401k at work, and if they are matching, then you've got to max out. Well, first, you've got to at least do the matching as a bare minimum. That's free money. But at the same time, the 401k is still going to be one of your better options for putting away a significant amount of wealth. Because if you earn too much, you're not going to get a deduction through an IRA. So you might as well put as much as you can in the 401k. Hmm. So I recognize also that you know, 10, 20 years down the road, they may roll that to an IRA and I may have access to the assets then. Definitely. But again, my goal is to help my client build their wealth. So I don't have a set strategy for anybody. It's what's going to help you build your wealth. I'm going to circle back to that use case in a second. That's how I want to end this. But we've spent a few cycles today talking about risk. I would say that's a very hot topic. I mean, obviously, when it comes to finances and investment, what's your risk tolerance is something that always comes up. And I think risk is a really interesting term, right? I mean, is from a 
financial planning standpoint, as a CFP, is there a measurable risk scale or a risk always going to be sort of a relative term in that each person I feel has a different risk tolerance, right? But how risky something is, it's truly relative to each individual, right? So I'm looking for is, is there a measurable, this is the riskiest investment, this is the least risky investment. Is there some sort of measurable scale that the financial planning world uses to look at the investment opportunities? I'll give you the unmeasurable scale. I tell any client that I believe in the sleep factor. If you can't sleep at night, you're invested wrong. So let's start there. We can talk about risk. We can talk about, hey, I want to grow my wealth. I want to take risk and all that sort of thing. But if the market is down and you can't sleep at night or you're worried about your investments, you're invested wrong to begin with. In terms of like numbers and measurable, though, you can look at, uh, say, an equity investor and take the long-term averages of the equities versus down versus up and say, okay, how comfortable would you be if you had an average downturn in equities? Okay, let's look at bonds. How comfortable would you be with an average downturn in bonds? And then other alternative asset classes there, and you put a mix together that actually meets the client's needs to say, okay, we're managing your risks. In an average downturn, you should be good. But obviously, the unaverage out downturn, we'll deal with that when it comes up. You, know, you can only plan for the things that you can see. You can only plan for the conditions as they are. Putting money in Roth IRAs and whatever else, they could change the law. So when it comes to risk, it's very much like that, that you, you manage from what you know, and then you deal with the unknown. Uh, it's a little bit like the military background of no plan survives contact with the enemy. We'll put a plan together. We'll try to manage the risk. We'll make sure you're comfortable with that risk. You can sleep at night. We'll look at these numbers and say, okay, if this happened, would you be comfortable with it? And try to dial that risk in so that you get to a level you are comfortable with. And then look at the upside and say, okay, this is what you stand to make. Also, having managed the downside risk, you've limited your upside growth. You're good with that too. Yeah, that's great insight. I'm going to double back on the the example you gave earlier. In fact, I mean, it's sort of speaking to myself. So I'm going to kind of use myself. In my sort of sales role, especially as an outside sales guy, we find that you mentioned you have the opportunity to be able to, to max out or match your company's 401k and start to invest in the Roth IRAs, right? So if I could, I guess to just be straight, if you have a client that comes in, they've had the opportunity to max out retirement accounts and they've done the sort of bare minimum, right? I would say most folks in at least my little immediate network have had the chance to at least go by and maximize that. What are some other levers that we could be looking at? Well, there's a couple parts to those that come to mind. And one of those is also recognizing the conversation of the traditional versus the Roth. Traditional 401k versus Roth 401k, traditional IRA versus Roth IRA. Sure. And when it comes to that choice, what I tell people is you go where your maximum benefit is. So for a low earner, you're not going to have as much benefit from a traditional model that's going to give you a tax deduction now because you're paying very little taxes as it is. So absolutely, you want to go with the Roth. Tax-free in retirement is a great benefit. You look at the very high earner, and the, the traditional makes a whole lot of sense because it could be in the range of a third or more of your income that you're saving right off the bat just by investing in the traditional IRA or 401k. So the Roth isn't necessarily your best bet there. And then between that, you've got a choice to make. To say, okay, well, what are my future views, tax rates, and whatever else? If we're at, currently at a very low tax rates and we look the way at the government spending, chances are tax rates in the future could be higher. Maybe I'll sacrifice some tax now so that I can have tax free in retirement. You know, you, you look at what your own bias is with that. So when you're looking at where you can put your money, maxing out the 401k is a great way to do it, especially if you're going to get a match. Once you've done that, you still can do the Roth IRA, as long as your income, of course, is below the limits. If that doesn't work, then there's such a thing called a backdoor Roth IRA that recent legislation has, has allowed where you can put money into a traditional IRA and you can convert it to a Roth. As long as your CPA is comfortable with that, that's a strategy that, that exists out there as well, where you can try to build some Roth assets. If you're maxing out everything you can in retirement and you want to put more money away, your emergency fund is built, you've got a down payment for a future house, all the things that you think you're going to need on the taxable side, then you could look at things like annuities and whole life insurance and some of those things to try to put away more tax deferred money that you can use later in the future. Annuities, especially understanding what annuity is, where life insurance is insurance in case I die. An annuity is an insurance in case I live too long. It's longevity insurance. And so that's something that when you get to retirement, you plan to have social security, you plan, we're well, probably not going to have pensions anymore. But an annuity is a way to replace what used to be a pension and say, okay, my fixed expenses, I want to make sure that those things are covered in retirement. Between my social security and this annuity, I'm building my own pension and I know those things are covered. 
Now, what I've saved in my 401k and IRAs, that's the money for all the variable expenses in my life and the things that I want to do. So that's just kind of a big picture saying that there are other avenues out there outside of the 401k and the traditional methods that you can put money away in a tax deferred fashion that can be very beneficial when you need it down the road. Yeah. And that's what I was looking for. We're right on time. I'm going to open the floor. I mean, have I missed anything? Maybe closing thoughts, remarks. I, we've covered, I've tried to cover 15 years of CFP experience in about, oh, and about, <laughs> yeah, 19, 19 years of, of, of experience in about 50 minutes. Have I missed anything or maybe some closing thoughts, just something I kind of wrap on from here? No, I think you actually asked some, some very probing questions. I think the conversation that we had, I think, was beneficial for anybody who's listening to it. I would say the bottom line is that a podcast like this isn't financial planning. So anybody that has questions should reach out to an advisor of some kind, someone that they trust. Maybe start with a parent, start with a friend, some, and then they might point them to a professional that they trust. Most people make the mistake in the industry that 1.9% that people see on average for the last 20 years comes from unprofessional behavior. And that's what a professional is to help provide is that steady hand that gets you the higher returns over the long term through the worst of times. Yeah. So it is worthwhile to work with a professional so you get professional outcomes. Just make sure that that professional is looking out for your interests and make sure also that you don't feel the need to count the costs when you're calling in with questions. If you're paying an advisor to advise you, then you should be able to call them uh, anytime when you've got a question. I got clients that call me on the weekends and say, I'm looking at a car I want to buy. What do you think? I pull up their stuff and say, well, you're looking pretty good, or I would do it this way. You might want to consider this. It's an ongoing relationship that isn't bound to the hours of the market, bound to the days of the week. It's an ongoing relationship of, of a financial advice that touches in so many areas. You don't want to be thinking about what's the cost if I call this guy to ask any sort of questions. Yeah. I'm going to double down on that piece and that knowing, I mean, you're a busy cat and spread thin. For someone that wanted to follow you, get content, hopefully have the opportunity to connect and maybe build a relationship. What's the best way to get a hold of you, contact you, all that good stuff? Well, I'll give you my 800 number. That's very simple. 800-513-2812. I do answer questions and I don't charge by the hour. So that's, if you have questions, I'm always glad to answer them. Then I would also direct them to my website, www.yankeefinancial.com and recognize Yankee has one E. Family joke is you have to buy vowels and we're cheap. So <laughs> www.yankefinancial.com. And there you'll find under About Us, I've got my newsletters out there. I've got a commentary that I write. I'm a, I'm a regular contributor to Attorney at Law Magazine. I've got my Capital Markets Review. It's updated uh, quarterly and I put it out there on my website. And again, I answer questions. So all of these things that you're going to find are going to give you information on the markets, a broader view of how I see things. But then it comes down to that personal question that uh, feel free to reach out and you have those. Yeah, I will echo. I mean, I'm a big fan of your website. I've spent several hours over the last week or two scouring it for information. I will put links to everything that we discussed in the show notes today, including to the CFP board website, to Patrick's website. I'm thinking I may even include the Q1 review, capital market review that I watched just because it was super educational. For the folks that have tuned in today, I really appreciate your ears. Please reach out with any feedback, comments, concerns, remarks, questions, anything that I could possibly field. And as always, stay on that grind. Patrick and I have actually kept a pretty regular cadence since the podcast wrapped up or since we finished recording. In our last conversation, he made another point that I jotted down and I at least wanted to read to you guys and make sure that that I got this message to you as well. Another difference between, it's not even worth including it. So you guys can end where I ended it the first time. I'm sorry for making you listen all the way through here. I'm so excited to have this thing going. I know I said that out of the gate, but this is just, yeah, I've got all the creative juices and entrepreneurial juices flowing. That was an exciting interview. I thought Patrick did an amazing job, obviously came well prepared. I appreciate the energy and his sort of consistency there. Patrick and I post interview have kept a regular cadence and he has just been over the top helpful just how he was here on the episode. He has stayed that consistent throughout this relationship. And so just a huge shout out and appreciation for him. I will continue to push you guys. I mean, obviously visit the show notes, go check out his website, a bit about him, his family, he sits on the East Coast. He's up in, in North Carolina. 
if any of you guys happen to be in the area, again, he's been over the top helpful. Feel free to invite him for lunch and pick his brain a bit. Along those same lines, there at the end of the podcast, he offers up the ability to reach out if you guys have any questions. Please take him up on that. That's an awesome offer. It's an awesome opportunity. Maybe you don't want to craft an email or some sort of quote unquote formal message or question and send that over to him. Send something half-assed to me and let me make that pretty or whatever that is. And I'll actually bounce that off Patrick in our next conversation. Again, he and I have kept a really regular cadence here. Let me bounce that off of him. Maybe it's a question that other folks here in the network or within our platform have. And I can actually roll that question and answer out to the rest of the folks as well. Maybe through some sort of social platform or whatever that is. If you guys have any questions, comments, feedback, anything of that nature, feel free to reach out. Info at roadstowealth.com. This is my first swing at this. So all feedback, direction, whatever you guys have is, I mean, accepted and appreciated. And that's all I've got. So until next time, I appreciate your ears. Hope you all stay on that hustle, stay on that grind. Have a great week. <laughs> so smooth. You know what I'm saying? Keep on made to be by the way, just to let y'all know what's going on. <laughs> It's the, it's the, it's the road of the wealth, yeah, yeah. I do it for health, yeah, yeah. It's the road of the wealth, yeah, yeah. For my kids and my spouse, yeah, yeah. It's the road of the wealth, I do it for health, yeah. For my kids and my spouse, yeah. I'm financially sound, yeah, yeah. It's the road of the wealth, yeah. I do it for health, yeah. For my kids and my spouse, yeah. Financially sound If life about purpose, it gives you something to see in uh, I've been setting cash goals, financially speaking uh, I've been finding blessings through all of these demons uh, I pray to God, I give you something to reach with uh, Say I give you something to leave with This life about goals and achievements Your eyes on the prize, they hit out your mind And pray to whatever beliefs in Teach on the way, know that they're beach on the way Gotta shine hard and the teachers water Know that little seed, they gon' grow the So Every day, you gotta come with us so they give you something to stand on Make the fuss off when you land raw Make you put some new friends on It's the road of the world uh, I do it for hell yeah. My kids and my spouse I'm yeah. financially sound uh, It's the road of the world yeah. I do it for hell yeah. My kids and my spouse I'm yeah. financially sound You can bet that